I taught critical thinking at the University of Oregon while I was a graduate student as part of a grant program to help students who were ill prepared for the university. Um, the, the outcomes assessment was very easy because we tracked how well these students did who took my classes and if they went on to graduate that was a success and if they dropped out then that was a failure on my part as well as a failure on their part. One of the things that became pretty clear was that theory didn't help them much. Uh, I gradually became more and more grouchy about argumentation theory and about critical thinking theory and uh, this grouchiness, partly because I was arrogant and full of myself, uh, started taking the form of doing presentations at a series of conferences that were held at Sonoma State University in, uh, in California, organized by uh, people including the woman whom Lars uh, cited, uh, Linda Elder, and uh, And, let's see, uh, Richard Paul, I blocked on his name. This is going to be kind of odd, you realize. I'm very short on sleep. This might not work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, uh, it took the form, in particular, of a couple of presentations that I want to mention to you. Uh, one of them was that I suggested, I did a workshop for uh, teachers of critical thinking. You may not realize a piece of background here. At Oregon, where I was teaching critical thinking, I was, uh, I was the only person on faculty for a long time, and then Don started uh, teaching classes with the title critical thinking some. But there was no requirement at the university that students have a course in critical thinking. Uh, when I moved to California, uh, as perhaps some of you know, there was a requirement that every student in the community college system, the state university system, and the University of California system, which is the research-oriented uh, higher education system, uh, they all have to take a course in critical thinking, and that course has to include uh, deductive logic. Uh, it has to include a logic course, as well as uh, courses about how to handle arguments. Uh, I taught a, I did one presentation in which I uh, worked to uh, get teachers to teach critical thinking in something like the following way. Uh, you gather up a bunch of critical thinking courses, I, I mean textbooks. You gather up a bunch of textbooks and what you do is you uh, concentrate on the ones that have answers at the back of the book. So uh, some of these textbooks have uh, every fifth exercise will have an answer at the back of the book. This is supposed to help students uh, learn how to do the stuff that the textbook recommends. And what I recommended was that you get the students to uh, work with examples like those examples in which there are answers at the back of the book with the goal that when they are good at it, they will be able to tell you why the answers at the back of the book are always wrong. <laughs> <clears throat> um, it seems to me that it's actually not very hard to do, but uh, this didn't take. They kept on having the same old uh, conferences as they always do. <clears throat> um, And also, it turns out that my trying to do that didn't help the students much either. Uh, I've taught uh, critical thinking a little bit differently since then, and what I do now is that I concentrate on minimizing theory and giving them a lot of practice, not in evaluating arguments, but in describing arguments and in clarifying issues, and uh, then uh, responding to arguments, mostly with descriptions, but then by providing their own arguments, and then by providing anticipation of objections and uh, responding to those objections in a thoughtful way. Okay, there's a line, of, I'm going to read some paragraphs from what I, 
I have here. <clears throat> There's uh, the first part here is drawing some parallels between uh, thinking about the criteria of good arguments and thinking about criteria elsewhere in philosophy because I'm convinced that uh, that this is a problem not just for critical thinking, but a problem for philosophy uh, in many other places as well. There's a line of thought philosophers often seem to find beguiling at the very beginning of several different kinds of problems. That line of thought goes roughly as follows. We need criteria to know what we are talking about. In more gaseous words, the means by which we can properly apply one concept to a great many different examples have to include criteria, else we do not know where or how the concept is applicable. So we've heard some of this talk already. For the word goodness, or the concept goodness, for example, there must be some set of rules or a formula or some criteria in order to protect us from chaos or from relativism. Without rules or criteria, the idea seems to be anything goes mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. So part of what I'm talking about then is uh, going to have the effect of calling that line of thought in, into question. Um, I mentioned, but I'm not going to talk about it uh, much here, the idea that uh, Plato's definitional questions uh, seem to me to be a good way of teaching students about the existence of this line of thought. Uh, we all those, I always put them as what is X comma real and then a question mark. Um, the argument that we need some kind of a definitional account, it seems to me, shows up in critical thinking as well as in Plato on many other topics. And I think that in our philosophy journals in the library, you will still find this kind of an argument. The argument is that uh, examples, providing examples, won't do the job for us because we were interested in one thing and the examples are a great many things. Uh, we can't tell, given a potentially endless list of examples, what it is that's going to go on the list after this. Uh, we can't tell how to identify another putative example as a legitimate one or an illegitimate one. And so what we need is, I'm rehearsing an argument, all of you should be able to rehearse to your students, and all you students should be able to rehearse back to your teachers. Um, the, uh, what we need is an insightful, definitional account that illuminates the heart of the matter and which will function as a set of rules by which we can sort examples so that we can tell, we can do the work that we would have done by thinking without doing the thing. <clears throat> uh, now, I'm going to, I think that that line of thought lies behind the idea of what is a good argument, and uh, I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about this. I want to explore the question, what are the criteria for a good argument? And I wrote this for, close to the end of my investigation, so I'm going to summarize what I think I've found. And I, I, I didn't quite understand who was going to be in the room here. I think that in some ways, uh, a lot of what I'm saying here winds up being unnecessary. So you should regard this as uh, just uh, you know, a visitor from far away preaching to the choir. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you all things that are not controversial. Nobody has to ask me any tough questions. <laughs> uh, so here's the answer. There are no criteria. There are no criteria for a good argument. There is nevertheless no danger of relativism or anarchy because the issues to which arguments are addressed make other particular arguments relevant, and those can be arranged beside each other in perspicuous ways which help us when we try to follow the good arguments where they lead. Particular candidates for theories proposing criteria turn out to be laughably inadequate. I think this is one thing that sounds like quite a few of you would agree with. 
Uh, this shows up when they are held up to actual examples of issues and their relevant arguments. Our non-philosophical practices and our philosophical practices reveal that we teach, that we treat issues as packages whose relevant arguments serve for each issue as the measure or the test of any argument on that issue. But those practices also serve as the tests of any proposed criteria. Now, I need to say that over again. I'm going to suggest uh, the name of this actually came from Don. The phrase is the worry method. <clears throat> uh, I'm going to give a little description of what that looks like. And then my suggestion is that that method, which is not actually a method at all, but that's that Don is often ironic, and I take this to be a little piece of irony on his part. It's uh, more like an approach. It's very loose. It's pretty chaotic. Uh, but I want to suggest that it is the criteria for checking criteria, that it's the criteria of any theory of argumentation. The issues to which arguments are addressed make relevant other arguments to consider and to answer. An implication of this is that the unit of discourse, when we argue outside the philosophical hothouse of theory, is not the argument, but instead is the issue. That means that there are probably a lot of arguments that are part of the same unit of discourse. With attention to those issues, we can describe what happens when we do our work well, this description is easy to recognize and easy to give, and it's not the property of, phil of philosophers. So what I'm saying then is that the worry method is as close as we've got to the standard of good arguments, and it is the standard for standards of good arguments, or theories of good arguments. Um, in the paper, what I do, I think I'm going to wind up skipping some of this, but I talk about proposals for people to think about uh, or proposals that people have made suggesting ways to think about what makes a good argument. Uh, I don't talk much about uh, Kyan Perelman, but I think that I'm going to have to add a, a section of this paper uh, talking about that. But what I do talk about is I talk about the idea of formal logic. Um, and I, I, I think I probably will quote part of that saying why it is that that won't work, not because I think any of you think that it would work, but because you might find yourselves, as I often find myself, uh, facing logicians who are convinced that what they have is, um, well, let, let's say that they are literalists, if not fundamentalists, about, uh, about logic. <clears throat> Uh, I also take up uh, fallacy theory, and of course that's a non-starter, so I don't think I'm going to talk to you about that. Uh, I talk about, and I don't know if this happens to be a topic in, uh, in Britain or not, uh, but uh, about uh, uh, Bloom's taxonomy of education cognitive objectives. Is this something that's familiar to some of you? Would you nod your heads and smile if it is? <laughs> okay. Um, I uh, talk a little bit about models of science as providing a way to think about what arguments are good arguments and what arguments are not arguments, or not good arguments. Um, <clears throat> and I talk about Richard Paul and Linda Elders. Uh, they, they keep changing what they call it, but the dialogic approach or the dialogue models approach, uh, which uh, I think I probably have extra animosity toward that just because of having participated in all of those, uh, all of those conferences. Those conferences are still going on, although they do not go on at Sonoma State. Instead, they have formed a, a big uh, military industrial complex of their own uh, in the Bay Area of California. <clears throat> so here's, here's the description of how uh, the worry method might look. And I'm going to say more probably than I need to say because this is all uh, really only reminders to you about how you, who are all 
smart and thoughtful people and who try to uh, avoid having hidden agendas and uh, letting grudges run the show. So I sometimes talk to my students about uh, a lesson that I would recommend they attribute to Freud, that we often believe not on the basis of arguments, uh, Login, but on the basis of desire. Well, we don't do that. We don't let desires run our thinking. Uh, so perhaps some of this is stuff that you would be able to say for yourself. Um, and we call, I think that this is what you call critical thinking. And I sometimes do little sermonettes in my classes uh, in which I sketch this process, the worry method, and I tell them about the great rewards that will come to them if they learn this, learn the worry method and if they make it a reflexive uh, sort of response when they are faced with issues and arguments in which they have some interest. And I tell them that if you learn to think this way, if in the rest of your college career, if in your uh, work career after you leave college, uh, if you think using these questions and these kinds of approaches, then first of all, your teachers and your future bosses will be surprised. They will be delighted. They will give you better grades. They will give you raises. They will give you more responsibility. Uh, your life will be such that you won't need to yearn for living forever. Uh, and uh, if you don't learn these things, then none of those things will happen to you, and you may not make it through the university, and you will wind up living under a bridge with barbecuing squirrels on a skewer. <laughs> and um, I, I make this ser little sermonette uh, you know, more than once over the course of the semester's uh, work on critical thinking. First, what you do is you articulate, I'm tempted to tell a Poincaré story, but I'm not going to. I'll tell it to somebody else later if they want. Um, <laughs> First, you articulate the issue clearly. It turns out that this is uh, pretty hard to do and that students often need some help. So I'm going to mention in just a moment some of the help that's offered for this. Uh, we as philosophers have a particular interest in clearly, the word clearly, and so uh, it seems to me that it's appropriate that we are the ones who should be trying to teach students how to do this. Um, I recommend that they start by putting the question in a neutral way so that uh, those who disagree can both at least agree on what the question is. Um, and then you <coughs> articulate all of the relevant arguments on that issue and all of the relevant objections to the arguments on that issue. This takes a long time. That means that there is a very serious speed limit in classes and in a student's own life when it comes to trying to do this work and that one of the most iniquitous things that you can do is try to offer to them shortcuts in the form of the theories of argumentation that will help them avoid doing this work <clears throat> a description of the arguments that have been provided uh, in, needs to include an acknowledgement of the objections. And of course, the fact that you need the objections means that the people who disagree with you are actually a great help to you as you try to think, do the thinking. Uh, what this means is that if you really are interested in thinking about the issue, I have moments while I'm talking to you of thinking I must be boring you to tears because you all know all this stuff, I think. Uh, but one of the interesting things that students do not realize is that their opponents are a help to them as they do this work. That every argument that can be brought forward on the issue, in a way it, it makes the distinction between good arguments and bad arguments problematic because even the bad arguments are helpful to you as you think. 
uh, and all of the arguments, even the bad arguments, even uh, the Rush Limbaugh arguments, are a help to you as you think these things through. Um, and students who are used to just putting up token objections so that they can shoot them down uh, find this a hard lesson to learn. Descriptions of each argument in this will include, and this is just a teaching strategy, I don't think that this is very important, uh, but I ask them to include in descriptions of all of the arguments, first of all, a discussion of what's at issue, but then what the position is that the speaker has endorsed, and then what it is that the speaker thinks supports that. I make distinctions among things like evidence and reasons and insights, previous agreements, all of those different things that can serve as, as support. Um, and then, and I used to think that this was just my nervous tick in the face of uh, bad critical thinking books and logic books. Uh, I ask my students to talk about who's talking, to whom are they speaking, for whom are they speaking, and crucially, is the speaker like or unlike you and me? Does the speaker have some sort of extra uh, background or some sort of particular worry that helps to run the argument that they have offered? Okay, you do that, uh, I, I say that arguments are offered by human beings. Uh, I think that might be part of the concept of a human being, actually. Uh, and then you do that with all of the arguments. All of the arguments. You array the arguments with their objections so that which arguments support other arguments and which arguments oppose other arguments is visible to you. Uh, you can sometimes, I think, use the, uh, the metaphor of a police lineup. Uh, or you can include uh, cross-referencing mechanisms that uh, can be put in some sort of a graphical form. Uh, then what you need to do is you need to go back and discuss the issue again. You started out by saying what the issue is. You need to end by saying what the issue is. And it seems to me that if you do that fairly often, the need to evaluate the arguments, which we are so often told is the goal of doing critical thinking and the goal of doing logic, it winds up being a very small byproduct of this process. The business of reading the arguments is the business where the critical thinking is the most crucially needed and the most crucially neglected. So none of this is meant to be anything very new. Um, and uh, I'm going to provide, let's see, I want to say a little bit about uh, formal logic. And uh, and if you do try to do this work, thinking of it not as critical thinking and not as a separate discipline, but instead a whole lot of thinking up individual issues and actually thinking about the issues. So there's, there's I think of it as a demarcation problem, like, like the demarcation problem in science. Uh, and what I want to say about it is there is a problem in the demarcation of critical thinking from other disciplines at the university. And part of the right answer is that uh, critical thinking is not a separate discipline from other topics. Critical thinking, this is a little bit like uh, McPeck, John McPeck's book several years ago, uh, making a suggestion that critical thinking is always critical thinking about particular topics. Um, he's wrong about that but it's a related kind of problem. But if you do think about the business, the task of your students as the task of thinking through an issue right down to the very end, trying to make progress on an issue, 
then it becomes less of a separate discipline. Um, and we can point to, see, I'm proceeding at a very high altitude here and at too fast a, a rate of speed, but I'm taking it for granted that you can supply examples for this. Um, let me say a little bit about logic. <clears throat> I think that logic has undeniable benefits for students who are taught it. Uh, some of the most important of these benefits are, have to do with cultural literacy and historical literacy, uh, though I think that these are, in my department, those are not very often part of the course. Uh, I think the philosophy of logic is also a good topic for the, kind, the right kinds of students. Uh, I think that giving students literacy with topics like validity versus truth, inconsistency versus contradiction, abstract form versus content, is a good idea, but along with it, you should make them paranoid about all of those, <laughs> all of those distinctions. Uh, there are problems with the idea that logic can provide the criteria for uh, deciding whether an argument is a good argument, um, and uh, I'm going to recite some of these problems. One of them is that deductive validity is not very often applicable to arguments outside of philosophy or outside of math or outside of philosophy of math, um, if it is applicable at all, even there. Uh, when you are reading letters to the editor or processing a discussion in a committee meeting, it's only exceptional cases in which the issue of whether the argument is deductively valid can be brought to bear. Uh, next, logic is silent on whether among valid arguments any are more crucial or relevant or better or worse than any other valid argument. Thumbs up or thumbs down is a very coarse set of for arguments. Last, well, another is that formal logic is relevant only after an argument has been rendered into its form. And logic cannot tell you whether you've done that well or ill. Uh, because logic takes arguments to consist only of premises and conclusions and neglects the description of the issue as a part of describing the argument that notoriously leads logicians into an inability to tell arguments from non-arguments. I'm going to provide an example of this. Uh, I'll try to make this go pretty quickly. Uh, there are still, I still get logic textbooks sent to me by uh, publishers, as I'm sure a great many of you do. Uh, and one of the interesting things to me is that even though it doesn't, it's been displaced a little bit, there are still books being published which include uh, that uh, white bearded old specimen that goes, uh, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore, mm -hmm. and then I stop and say, ask the students, so what? And they, they haven't dealt with this yet, but they can all finish, therefore Socrates is mortal. And what I try to do is I point out to them the role that that has as an actual specimen in academic discourse. And the first thing to say is that nobody is saying that Socrates is mortal. The role that that little specimen has is as a way of illustrating some terminology, teaching people <coughs> vocabulary and how to deploy the vocabulary, how to have uh, certain kinds of conversations. So I uh, use those three sentences on the board to make claims about validity, to draw distinctions between content and form, and then I quote from some of the textbooks that use it. Uh, I do substitutions using different words. I quote uh, Carnap saying that uh, logic is the pure syntax and the pure semantics of an ideal language, and I explain what that means. Uh, I teach them how to do the substitutions uh, instead of mortals and men and uh, instances, we'll talk about other classifications of things. Um, and I invite the students, I do all of this in a fairly straight, with a straight face. 
I do this without sneering or uh, poking fun at it, until I can get students to suppose that what they have been presented with is an argument. Um, it's not only an argument, it's a good argument. It's not only a good argument, it's as good as arguments get because it's valid and the premises are true. We talk about literal versus figurative uh, meanings for the claim that Socrates is mortal and we point out that it has to be literal if there's really uh, a point to the claim being made. Um, I might talk about uh, Aristotle and syllogistic and what seems like a fairly desperate sort of ploy of making a category that includes just one creature, uh, Socrates. I might talk about Barbara. Uh, I get the class to engage in a discourse with me that brandishes the terms argument, mortality, and so on. Uh, but then there's a sea change that I try to work, <clears throat> and I try to make it dizzy. Uh, that has to do with asking what's at issue in the argument. And uh, so it's pretty clear that the issue is, allegedly at any rate, whether Socrates is mortal. So we go back to literal versus figurative. He's not mortal, really, in a way, and so we talk about that. Well, but in a way, he's got to be mortal, and so on. No one's trying to read. I point out that this is a dead issue. Uh, there's a problem about whether this is really an argument. Uh, it's not about the durability of one per, of a person's work. Uh, if it were, the soundness of the argument would get sucked up in the same water spout which takes away the truth of the first premises. But there's no literal issue. The issue is a non-issue. Raising the issue would seem to require desperate measures or a philosopher with a thought experiment. So, suppose you are as I was in the Ozarks in Missouri, uh, a teenage hillbilly with a strong religious background, terribly bright, <clears throat> but also very ignorant, somewhat superstitious. Suppose that you finally come down out of the hills into the nearest big city, and that the nearest big city that you come down to is Athens in about 405 BC. <laughs> You're making your way to the, your city cousin's house. You're gaping at the exotic persons, the animals, the dust, throngs, jabbering in other tongues which you didn't even know existed, grand houses. On your way through the agora, you eavesdrop and you slow and you get pulled sideways as if by a whirlpool, Charybdis, and then stop on the edge of a group of vehement and serious discussants, though their talk is often mixed with laughter and widespread. You wind up fascinated as the group worries over ideas you barely grasp, and an old, somewhat ugly man badgers the discussants with questions and comments. He asks, what about this? And if that were true, then would it not be that this other thing you do not want is also true? And our argument, if we are not careful, will have no mercy on us, but will be like sailors trampling over seasick passengers. And must you not at this point choose between the thing you said and the thing you say now? And the other interlocutors work away, and they're very bright. But nevertheless, sooner or later, most of them wind up retreating, and they say things like, well, Socrates, I didn't see that. I stand corrected, Socrates. I think you must be right, Socrates, to question this way. I am now confused, Socrates, and I must go away and reconsider your question. <laughs> you continue listening silently as the afternoon gives way to twilight, and you don't notice, just as most of the people seem not to notice, as dinner time comes and goes, though there's some change in the cast of characters, usually with fond farewells and glad welcomes. It grows dark. The knot of arguing and questioning philosophers begins to thin, Finally, you come to your senses as if from an absence seizure, and you make your way through the maze of streets, according to your directions, to your city cousin's house. Your city cousin answers the door and yells at you, where the hell have you been? We called the cops hours ago. 
You explain that you've been in the Agora and what you've been doing. One old man, though mostly he only asked questions, seemed preternaturally wise, Socrates. I.e. Socrates, your city cousin rolls her eyes. You say, I was thinking as I walked over here that no man could be so wise. And I wonder, cousin, whether you agree. I think Socrates might be a god come to earth <clears throat> in disguise in order to enlighten us. What say you? Do you think Socrates might not really be a mortal? One of the odd things that this sort of thought experiment does is it reminds us that my three lines on the blackboard, though I call them an argument, may not have been an argument at all, since if it's an argument, what is the issue? Here, though, that is, in the example given to us by the thought experiment, we come close to raising the issue. And the thought experiment prompts the insight that if your city cousin were to give the three lines we put on the blackboard, <laughs> something which seems so unlikely as to be absurd, it would be a very poor argument, since it would not take the question seriously. That is, if she were to say, what rot? Of course he's mortal. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. If she were to say, then she has not addressed your question at all, but instead has begged the question. Or she's joking, a scary in-joke, and not arguing at all. What shall we do with this? <clears throat> the blackboard example was not offered in hopes of settling some such question, it was not offered in order to settle any issue at all. It helps instead to illustrate some distinctions and some concepts in the academic discipline of logic to show some of how a logical approach works, maybe with the goal of helping students become more precise and self-aware. None of that is taken away by pointing out that it's really not an argument, unless someone thinks that it's being an argument is important to the enterprise of drawing those distinctions and sharpening those thinkings. It may be important to some to think that the series of three sentences on the board is an argument. But if so, then they are wrong. Their being wrong is partly because of their not paying attention to questions about context of arguments, issues as parts of arguments, not using the worry method. <clears throat> there are some implications for logical theory and for our understanding of what an argument is, or perhaps there are implications for our misunderstanding thinking that an argument is a series of statements, one of which is allegedly supported by the others. The implications help make a case. Don Lady used to talk about Procrustean beds. Did he mention that today? No. Um, the implications help make a case that there may be a danger in taking a term, argument, out of the context in which it makes sense. The danger is that we turn the term into nonsense. The three lines on the blackboard are either not an argument at all, or they are a very bad argument. Better arguments are to be had, too. It would be better, for instance, if your city cousin were to say, I think I'm probably unfairly buying into the bad rap that she has among in uh, dead white European male history. <clears throat> uh, what rot? Socrates is mortal, all right. You should see the way his wife, Xantippe, treats him. No, God, you will take that kind of crap. <laughs> or, in the same spirit, when he eats fish and milk together and gets diarrhea, surely no, God, you would do that. We may have bought into logic's conception of arguments too quickly and too uncritically. We may have thought that three sentences on the blackboard actually say something, when we would have been better off to treat them only as sentences on a blackboard, which illustrates some ways of talking we do in logic. Frank Eversole used to call this thinking that sentences on a blackboard, which are not part of an example, say something. He used to call that the blackboard fallacy. <clears throat> the notion that an argument is a series of sentences or statements, one of which is alleged to be supported by the others, that notion can be looked into and questioned. And questioned. One way of doing so is to consider the ways that people outside of philosophy talk to each other about arguments or deny that something's an argument, or to ask what somebody's argument is. What results from putting together a perspicuous array of such examples is that the notion of argument we get from logic begins to look highly questionable. 
crucial fault of that notion is that in its work toward formal considerations, it has to take up arguments in a dissociated way, divorced from the situations in which they are offered and divorced from the, from the issues to which they are offered. Mm, let's see. So the model of argument that we get from formal logic is incapable of justifying us in saying whether an argument is relevant, trivial, crucial, or better or worse than any other formally correct argument. That model is not able to tell arguments from non-arguments. Except in philosophy and highly mathematical disciplines, it's very seldom that anything remotely like formally valid arguments are offered in the ordinary give and take. Even when they are offered, the evaluation of those arguments is conspicuously not just an effort to apply the formal theory to see if the arguments measure up. And then the formal model only begins to do its work after the work of reading the argument and translating it into its form is over. Therefore, the formal model cannot help with any judgments as to whether the argument has been fairly represented in the form to which the model is brought to bear and therefore cannot be used as a as criteria for good arguments. Let's see, I think I can skip most of the rest of this. Uh, we don't take fallacies seriously, I think, as any kind of criteria for what counts as a good argument, uh, although I think we do collect, uh, let's see, Perry Weddle, who graduated from Oregon, had a little book uh, called Argument, in which he talks about the ecology of arguments as a way of referring to context. And uh, he claimed that he kept tabs on arguments and cataloged, I'm sorry, on fallacies, and that he cataloged over 2,000 separate categories of fallacies. But if you avoid committing any of those fallacies, that still shows you nothing about whether your argument is a good argument, only that it's not a bad argument in any of those 2,000 ways. Um, if you're interested in the Richard Paul and Linda Elder uh, uh, scheme of, it's basically a scheme in which different models of good arguments are offered from different uh, disciplines. And so it has the virtue of uh, referring to something like context and in each kind of context what you're offered is a recipe uh, or a checklist rather of uh, things that you ought to do and ought to keep in mind. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy is a very, uh, we don't need to talk about Bloom's taxonomy. Uh, scientific reasoning, I think, can be a help for students to learn about what good arguments are. But one of the interesting things for me is that what's uh, good about scientific reasoning is that it is based on something like the worry method as a way of handling and dealing with issues. Hmm. Okay. I'm quit. <clears throat> Thanks, Sean. I really yeah. that. Um, I don't know if you all agree with this or or not, whether it'll worry you or not. Maybe you'll just agree. There was just something that troubled me a bit about uh, your sort of central claim, there are no criteria for a good argument. It seems to me there's something, given what you want, I think you want to say, there's, isn't there something essentially misleading about putting it that way? I was reminded of the, the so-called uh, private language argument in Wittgenstein. Uh, the way that, that so-called argument is usually taken is people say something like, um, here is what a private language are, here is what a private language would be like. And that is not possible. And I think that's a total misunderstanding of the, the nature of the considerations, which right. because what Wittgenstein wants to get you to is a position where you just don't know what you want to mean anymore by that, where there is there is no that. Um, so in the same kind of sense, uh, is there not a danger that you in saying that there are no criteria for good art for a good argument make it sound as though you have any idea at all what it would be for there to be good criteria for a good argument? Well, I, uh, the, the quick sort of response that I'm tempted to make is that what I'm recommending is that 
uh, arguments not be separated from their context. And part of the implication of that is that you need to not separate what I've said from the rest of the paper. Uh, <laughs> the rest of the paper requires, offers recommendations that uh, we not think of evaluations of arguments separate from the issues to which those arguments are addressed. And that those issues then make other arguments relevant. And after you've made the other arguments relevant, and if you're interested in thinking the issues through, then what you have is an enormous amount of work to do sometimes. And that that's way better than having criteria for good arguments. Yeah, I mean, that's why I said I wasn't sure whether you would be worried yeah. at all by it. I, 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 I do understand that, and I have to say um, that your point uh, has been mentioned to me before, that people who have uh, listened to me talk about related matters uh, take me to be some kind of an anarchist regarding arguments, and I don't mean to be that at all. So your concern has to be a good concern, I think. I wasn't always sure that I was quite with you in your paper, quite what the structure was well, exactly. I wasn't either. Okay. <laughs> well, here's a chance for you to explain yeah. a bit of it. I mean, well, it's the stuff you tell your students, first of all, and then you, it's clear you tell your students a lot of stuff, and then a bit later on you tell them, well, it's not quite like that. And yeah. I like that way of doing it, but I wasn't sure of all the stuff you were withdrawing exactly. Well, one sort of at one stage, you seem to tell the students you should consider all the arguments on both sides of an issue, and I didn't understand that. But maybe we come back to that. That's not something I take back. That's not something you take back. No, well, I. No. Well, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm inclined right. to say maybe you should. Yeah. But. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to say that they should buy it or agree with it. Well, what's all the arguments mean? All the arguments that any lunatic might come up with, or all the arguments that have actually been offered? Offered by who, whoever it may be. It, oh no, to to us who are interested in thinking through issues. One of the things that I didn't do that's in the paper is I talked about having schemes for describing arguments and having schemes for <coughs> clarifying issues. So uh, in order to get myself halfway through the course, I give out a little check sheet for students that says, uh, when you just, you need to write me a three-part structure essay, an essay with a three-part structure for every assignment I give you all semester long. And the first part is giving a description of the argument, and it's really the only part where I have clear criteria for how to grade you. You need to tell me what the issue is, you need to tell me the position, you need to tell me the support, you need to tell me how the speaker Talk to me about the speaker, how the speaker is like or unlike you or me, what the speaker is worried about. And then that usually won't do. So there's an added piece right under issue in which you tell me how to think about the issue, how to clarify the issue. So you tell me how this issue came up, who broached this issue, what's the history of this issue, what's the background of it, what are the possible answers possible positions regarding this issue. What's at stake? Uh, you know, the so what question. And what difference does it make if you choose one of the possible positions rather than another? And then, what other issues are related to this issue? And then there are sometimes I make them think about whether terms can bias us and whether there's a danger that any of the terms being used in the prompt that they're working with uh, need to be paid attention to. Um, I think that paying attention to issues is one of the things that they can get from me, which at Humboldt State University, uh, there are two other people uh, who, who ask them to think about context and about background uh, in something like the same way I do. But most, of, there are, um, there's probably 25 to 30 sections of critical thinking taught at Humboldt State University every semester. 
And out of those, about four or five of them are taught by teachers who are asking them to pay attention to context and to issues. And I'm only teaching one or two of those. Yeah. I mean, that, I'm completely happy with that answer. But okay. here's another bit of thing, something okay. else you said to them. Um, your opponents are helpful to you. Do you leave that bit standing? I, I didn't hear you. Uh, another thing you say to your students is, your opponents are help. Your opponents are helpful to you. Yes. Do you leave that bit standing as well? I don't take that. Back. Well, if we really go with what you've just said, it seems to me you ought to take at least take that bit back. They're not helpful to you. You haven't the foggiest idea of what you're doing in presenting an argument, unless I mean, I take it this is what you've just been saying. I mean, you don't know what what an argument is unless. You have a conception of who it is you're addressing, who your opponent is. So it's not that your opponents are helpful to you, it's that the whole process of giving arguments in philosophy or anywhere else is completely senseless in without the context of thinking what a sane human being, what an opponent might say to you. Um, well, I, I don't quite know. Hmm. How to respond to that? It seems to me that at the end of the process, we are in a position uh, for which we owe gratitude to the process. And that all of the arguments, including those that betray themselves as uh, petty or vindictive or only interested in winning, uh, if they reveal themselves to be that through the process, then they are audiovisual aids to us. And that means they are aids to us. Okay. Yeah.